you are in the world watching this on Catch Up. Good morning or good evening. Uh, welcome along to this online session, uh, this year's uh, Festival of Ideas. To very briefly introduce myself, my name is Gary Brannan and I am the Keeper of Archives and Research Collections uh, here at the University of York. And it is my absolute delight, honour and privilege to host this session today. So the reason we are here today uh, we're going to be hearing from my excellent colleague, Sally Ann Schoen, as she explores material from the archives here at the Borswick Institute for Archives, specifically from the archives of the Joseph uh, Rantry Reform Trust, looking at John Bowes Morrill's proposal to create a folk park for the Heslington Estate and for York itself. His idea? Uh, was to preserve the evidence of rural communities and their way of life and to use this living museum to educate future generations. To introduce Sally, Sally is Collections Information Archivist here at the Borswick Institute for Archives and they've got additional responsibility for our volunteering programme. Sally's been with us since 2014 uh, and has been prior to coming here to York. Sally uh, volunteered at Wiltshire Museum, Wiltshire and Swindon History Centre, the Science Museum, Library and Archives and Kinarfan Record Office. That's enough from me from this point in time that right now, without any further ado, I shall hand over to Sally Ann for life as they'd like to see it at York's Folk Park. Uh, so hello and welcome. So I'm here today to talk about something that never happened, a lost project among, I'm sure, many lost projects that have been and gone in York over the centuries, and one which I did not expect to end up discussing when I set out to catalogue the extensive archive of the Joseph Rangie Reform Trust last year. The Reform Trust is one of three trusts founded by Quaker philanthropist Joseph Rangie in 1904, along with the Joseph Rangie Village Trust, now known as the Joseph Rangie Foundation and the Joseph Rangie Charitable Trust. Unlike its sister trusts, the JRRT was founded as a company with the power to give money to political and non-charitable causes. Having now spent months exploring the archive, I can vouch for there being a lot of politics in it. But in one of the boxes, I was intrigued to find a bulging file labeled York Folk Park. I knew something about there being plans once upon a time for a folk park here thanks to our Roundtree family and company archives. But the Reform Trust file was far more detailed than anything I'd read before, and its contents form the basis for this talk, highlighting the important role the Trust played in the scheme. The story of the Folk Park is one without a satisfying ending. You will no doubt have noticed that York doesn't have and has never had a Folk Park. But there was a time, two decades in fact, when we almost did, and that's what I want to talk about today. I would like to start by bringing you all with me to York, but not quite the one you're familiar with. It's a sunny June day and you've come by train for a day in the city. After tea at Betty's, a trip to the Minster and a walk along the city walls, you head to the Castle Museum near Clifford's Tower. By now, the museum has been open to the public for more than 80 years. You've read that it was the brainchild of Dr John Kirk, who was a voracious collector of everyday historical items, from horse bridles and milking stalls to medical paraphernalia, weapons, clothing, advertisements, and all kinds of household objects. He called them his bygones and was even known for accepting interesting objects in lieu of payment for his medical services. From 1938, his vast collection has been on display at the Castle Museum, which was built in what remains of York's female prison. The museum's biggest draw is the detailed recreation of a Victorian street, dubbed Kirkgate which was created under the direction of Dr. Kirk to provide a fitting backdrop for his collection. It was the first of its kind in Britain and remains enormously popular, filled with the artefacts of a long lost York, from the names of the shops themselves to the posters and advertisements that line the walls of the little back alleys displaying well-known names like Roundtrees and Terry's. But your visit to the Castle Museum is of course only half of the trip. Once you've walked through Kirkgate, taking a tour of what remains of the female prison and looked at the museum's displays, uh, displays of historic toys and its detailed recreations of period rooms. It's time to go from this museum of town life to its sister museum of country life, the York Folk Park. First, you have to decide how to get there. The park is not even two miles away, so you can make the journey on foot easily enough. 
via Blue Bridge and the new walk which runs alongside the River Ouse and out to Fulford. But you've heard it's possible to go by river, so you head to King's Staith instead to catch one of the regular boats that take you from the city centre to the park's own landing stage, allowing you to arrive in style. The first thing you spot upon arrival is the windmill, standing at the highest point of the park. Your guidebook tells you it's actually called a post mill, an early type of windmill that came into use from the 12th century onwards, and that this one is in fact the oldest surviving post mill in Yorkshire, dating from the 18th century. It was purchased from a site near Pontefract and transported to York to be rebuilt on its present spot. You're so busy admiring it that it takes you a moment to notice the boats drawn up near, next to the wharf where your own boat is docking. The boatman points out the Humber Barge, something that would have been a common sight transporting goods along the waterways of Yorkshire and the Humber up until the 1970s, and which can trace the design of its hull to that of Viking longboats. A little further along is a canal boat, something you're much more familiar with. And beyond that, a small round boat that's only really big enough for one person. The boatman tells you this is a coracle, a small fishing boat made of woven wood and materials such as woolen cloth, calico or leather. They were traditionally used in Wales, but also adopted elsewhere for their size and manoeuvrability. As you disembark, you spot a boat builder's workshop standing beside the wharf, and to your left, next to the Packhorse Bridge, stands the 19th century Raindale Watermill, which came to York from the North York Moors, close to newton upon Rawcliffe. <clears throat> The blades of the post mill are turning, as is the mill's water wheel. Both have been brought back to working order so visitors can see exactly how they were used and even buy the goods they produced in the case of flour from the post mill. But you will come back to those later. For now, you take the lane up from the wharf, past the basket makers, where you pause to watch a demonstration of traditional basket weaving, and past the circle of brightly coloured Romany caravans clustered in a tree lined clearing until you reach the village proper, where buildings line a main street with a market cross. This is by far the busiest part of the park. You see a village inn with its own brew house, a blacksmith shop, a wheelwright and a coach house. And everywhere you hear the sound of people working as locals carry out traditional crafts such as weaving, fulling, wood and metalwork, surrounded by authentic tools and materials. All of them are happy to answer questions and you can buy samples of their work to take home with you as a souvenir of your visit. Your guidebook tells you there's even a rope walk standing a little way up the hill behind the village, where you can have a go at making rope by hand if you feel up to the challenge. That sounds a little too much like hard work for such a warm day. So instead you cross the village green with its pond and original maypole, donated from the collections of the Castle Museum. Later there will be a game of cur and spell, a game played with a small wooden ball that was once popular in the textile areas of the West Riding, and a display of folk dancing after that, which you'd like to come back to watch. From the green, you head over to have a look at a small row of reconstructed yeoman's cottages, each one furnished to show how ordinary people lived in different periods through history, with helpful guides to demonstrate how things worked. There's even room for a larger timber house brought to York from the village of Helperby, and it reminds you a little of the half timbered two story houses you saw in the shambles earlier that day. You complete your initial circuit with a visit to the small farm where you can see a horse mill in action, another kind donation to the park. The nearby shed houses a collection of surviving carts and there are demonstrations of crafts such as hedging, thatching, rick building and hurdle making to enjoy. Once you've watched the horse turning the mill wheel, and visited the sheep, ducks and goats in their paddock, there's just time to have a look at the small maze, a replica of the Troy Town maze cut from the roadside turf between Terrington and Bransby in Yorkshire. The original is said to be the smallest remaining turf maze in Europe, dating from the 19th century, although your guidebook tells you that local legend claims it's far older. The name Troy Town recalls the labyrinthine walls of the ancient city of Troy, and their purpose in England is debated. Some say they were used for entertainment on high days and holidays, while others claim they had religious significance of some kind. Today, though, there are children playing along its paths. So you head back to the village to sample some of the brew house ale as you find a spot on the green to sit and await the folk dancing. <laughs> 
I hope you enjoyed your brief visit to the York Folk Park that never was, or one version of it at least. There are three versions of the park altogether, imagined over different sites and over some 20 odd years. Today, I want to talk about how the idea of the folk park came to be, why it was important and what it involved before answering the critical question, what on earth happened to it? The origins of the folk park, York Folk Park lie not in Yorkshire at all, but in Sweden, where the first folk park was created in 1891 at Skansen in Stockholm. In a century of extremely rapid change, Skansen was created to preserve evidence of a pre-industrial Swedish way of life before it was lost forever. The term folk in this context refers to the customs and culture of ordinary working people, whose homes, material possessions, crafts and stories were less likely to be preserved than those of the wealthy and therefore more at risk of disappearing. The methods used to assemble the park were novel for the time. Its founder, Arthur Azalius, travelled around the country buying some 150 houses, which he then had carefully dismantled and shipped to Stockholm to be rebuilt in the large park as authentic representations of pre-industrial Sweden. All of the buildings were open to the public and the park showcased traditional crafts, clothing and furnishings, along with the historic buildings themselves in both country and small town settings. The idea was soon taken up elsewhere. Another Swedish example was created at Lund in 1892, followed by a Norwegian open air museum in 1902, the old school museum in Denmark in 1914, and the Netherlands open air museum, which opened at Arnhem in 1918. And the idea soon caught on here too. The York Folk Park might have been intended as the first such park in Yorkshire, but it was not the first one in England. The self-proclaimed first open-air folk park in England opened in New Barnet, North London in June 1934, and much like Kirkgate a few years later, it was intended to display the personal and extremely varied collection of one man, Father John Ward. Like his fellow collectors on the continent, Ward's park was made up of historic buildings he had relocated from elsewhere, so his collection could be displayed, so far as possible, in authentic settings. His Abbey Folk Park included a working blacksmith shop, a tithe barn and a wheelwright shop. And there were also recreations of prehistoric and Neolithic huts and a Roman stove that could be demonstrated to visitors. Ward was not above adding some drama for interest, however. A 16th century cottage in the park was decked out as, a, as an Elizabethan witch's cottage, complete with talismans, strange symbols and information on casting spells. Although the park closed for good as a result of the Blitz, it was very popular, feeding as it did into a growing public concern about the destruction of Britain's heritage and rural landscape as a result of the rapid expansion of towns, cities and roads in the first half of the 20th century. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, this concern had produced tangible results, from organisations set up to protect churches and historic buildings from demolition and decay, to campaigns to save the countryside from the polluting effects of the motor car. In 1928, Clough Ellis Williams's book, England and the Octopus, took aim at the dangers of what he saw as uncontrolled residential and industrial development, particularly around London, which risked swallowing up the essence of the English countryside and destroying what he saw as what was left of the nation's rural character. 1932, the government passed the first Town and Country Planning Act, the first planning act to explicitly extend control over rural as well as urban development. In its scope of action, it included the preservation of existing buildings or other objects of architectural, historic or artistic interest and places of natural interest or beauty in the countryside as well as in towns and cities. Further planning acts were passed in 1944 and 47, followed by the Historic Buildings and Ancient Monuments Act in 1953. But as much as people were preoccupied with the physical preservation of buildings and landscape, they were also concerned about the preservation of what those things represented, an older and what many saw as a more traditional way of life. Rural and pre-industrial jobs, crafts and customs, ways of speaking and dressing, what people ate and drank, what they believed and how they travelled and spent their leisure time, aspects of history and identity that were at risk of being lost. The first half of the 20th century saw a growing interest in capturing the evidence of this vanishing way of life. As early as 1903, Cecil Sharp travelled through Somerset, collecting more than 1,500 folk songs from locals 
and people like Father Ward and Dr Kirk amassed their own collections of so-called bygones from a wide variety of sources. But crucially, this, this interest was not confined to wealthy collectors and academics. The history of the ordinary and the pre-industrial was given greater prominence in museums too, particularly the many provincial museums that sprang up in this period, which explicitly set out to showcase regional histories and identities. In 1928, there were 530 provincial museums and art galleries in Britain. Ten years later, this number had increased to 800. Appearing in county towns as well as cities, these museums drew their main audience from the local population and became repositories of regional artefacts and knowledge, working to keep this shared heritage alive through educational work and imaginative displays. Thus, by the 1930s, Hereford Museum had an old country life section with dairy churns and smocks, highlighting the region's farming history. Northampton Central Museum had a reconstructed cobbler shop to showcase the region's history of shoemaking. And York, of course, had Kirkgate, with its mix of 19th century trades and crafts, all of which had been drawn from the local area. In the 1950s, Frank Atkinson, director of Halifax Museums and the man who'd later create Beamish Open Air Museum, spent years collecting and photographing materials and skills used by craftsmen in South and West Yorkshire, seeking to preserve what he called the evidence of the mundane, grubby and everyday. The Folk Park or Open Air Museum offered an ideal way to combine these elements, creating a lost world in microcosm made up of buildings and artefacts that had been preserved, relocated and rebuilt so that visitors could more authentically experience in so much as that was possible, how people lived and worked in the past. As Yorworth Pete said when he opened the Museum of Welsh Life in Cardiff in the 1940s, the task was not to create a museum which preserved the dead past under glass, but one which used the past to link up with the present, highlighting the continuity in a time of rapid and dramatic change. Small wonder then that the Open Air Museum became popular here as well as on the continent. As well as the short-lived Abbey Folk Park, a Highland Folk Museum was founded in 1935, the National Museum of Wales at St Fagans in 1948, a Folk Museum for Ulster in 1958 and Beamish Living History Museum in 1972, amongst many others. You might think then that the time was ripe for one in Yorkshire too, and certainly that was the belief of this man, John Bowes Morrill. If you've ever visited the Borthwick, you'll be familiar with his name as you reach us via the Morrill Library, named after him in 1966. There's also a Bowes Morrill House in Warmgate in the city, and his name appears in many of our archives across a range of business, philanthropic, educational and cultural endeavours. If anyone could have founded a folk park here, it probably would have been him. Morrill came from a wealthy and very well-connected Yorkshire family. His father was general manager of the York City and County Bank, and Morrill the Younger enjoyed a long and successful career with the Roundtree Company, serving as the firm's finance director for many years. His influence in York was bolstered by his involvement in the newspaper industry. He was chairman of the Westminster Press for 20 years until 1953, and of the Yorkshire Herald Newspaper Company, which produced the Yorkshire Herald and the Yorkshire Evening Press, two of the city's most prominent newspapers. In addition to all of this, he was trustee and later chairman of the Joseph Rowntree Social Service Trust, now the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust, as well as a Liberal councillor for the City of York for 40 years and Lord Mayor twice. He also played a vital role in the cultural life of 20th century York, particularly the preservation of the city's heritage. In the 1930s, he chaired the Shambles Area Committee, which purchased and restored buildings on York's famous medieval street. And in the 1940s, he began buying historic properties in York with the aim of preserving and restoring them for the future. This would later become the York Conservation Trust, which counts among its properties medieval and early modern townhouses and York's Theatre Royal and Assembly Rooms. In 1940, he wrote a book called The City of Our Dreams, which set out his vision for a post-war development of York. In it, he stresses that improvements and modernization need not be at the expense of the buildings and character of the historic city. In York, he writes, we still have more of the past worth preserving than there is in any other provincial town in England. And we have no need to reconstruct, but only to preserve, and then to add what is worthy in modern architecture to stand by the examples of the past. Although his City of Dreams makes no mention of a folk park, it reflects many of the same concerns that Morrill would later put forward in defence of the scheme. In 
Most obviously, that necessary modernizations should not sweep away all before it, but also that the domestic architecture of the past, the surviving small townhouses, shops and workshops, should be preserved where possible alongside the grand mansions and civic buildings, and that museums, of which he mentioned several, were of great educational value to people of all classes. We know Morrill had a strong interest in the history of the ordinary and the everyday, because he had already been instrumental in the establishment of the Castle Museum, something he would later describe as perhaps the best work he ever did. In 1932, when Dr John Kirk was looking for a new home for his collection of bygones, it was Morrill who saw an opportunity to house them in historic prison that the City Council was then in the process of acquiring. Morrill held an influential position as chairman of the Council's Finance Committee, and both he and Kirk were familiar with the folk museums and parks of the continent. Kirk and his wife Nora had visited Skansen in Sweden in 1910, and Morrill and Kirk had both visited Munich Municipal Museum in Germany, which had been set up to show the, the history of the city, and which included a series of recreations of period rooms, something that would later be used to great effect at the Castle Museum. Kirk's sister had even visited Father Ward's Abbey Folk Park in London, although she'd been less than impressed with the curating practices there. Despite facing a number of hurdles in terms of cost and attracting local support, Morrill and Kirk campaigned successfully for the creation of the museum. By the time it opened, Kirk's collection of largely rural bygones had been bolstered by Morrill's own purchases from the city. These included the York Sheriff's Coach, which Morrill purchased for £15, and features from some of the city's lost historic buildings. Morrill was very proud of the museum's success, but he also felt it told only half of the story. It was, he wrote later, an illustration mainly of city life, but the life of the countryman should be preserved too before it was too late. <clears throat> the Castle Museum was already in possession of or had been offered a number of buildings it could not re-erect and display in its central York location including a water mill from Raindale, an 18th century post mill, and an old timbered building from the village of Helperby. What if they and others like it could be displayed nearby as a sort of sister attraction to the Castle Museum and as a way of preserving buildings that would otherwise be lost forever? The earliest document we have that sets out his vision for a folk park is dated November 1956. And interestingly, it shows that the title of Yorkshire or York Folk Park is a bit of a misnomer, because what Morrill was envisaging was actually an English folk park that just happened to be based in York. In the memorandum, he argues that folk materials, that is the mundane items that exemplify the history of ordinary people, had only recently begun to be given the prominence which their importance and interest deserve. It was not enough, however, to merely display them in cases in museums. To truly understand the folk life of the English people, such objects should be shown in their original settings, that is to say, in the type of buildings that once housed them. Throughout England, he writes, there are still fine examples of old water mills and windmills, small town dwellings, workshops, country cottages, farmsteads, barns and other such buildings, which are just as historically important as the great mansions, but every year sees more and more of them falling into ruin or being demolished to make way for new housing estates and other schemes. Unless an attempt is made to preserve them now, in a very short time, they will nearly all have disappeared. Whilst he felt it would be impractical to preserve them all in their original locations, relocating them to a folk park offered a number of advantages. There, the buildings could be shown as far as possible in their natural settings, appropriately furnished according to their respective historical origins. They would also be under constant supervision and less likely to fall into disrepair. But most of all, they would offer great educational value to students, school children, and the general public. At such a park, visitors could see how ordinary people had in the past lived and worked, with the whole park acting as a microcosm of English country life over the past 300 years. The site he had in mind was the Heslington Hall estate just outside York. The Elizabethan Hall and its grounds had been put up for auction by its owners, the Derrimore family, in 1955 and Morrill had stepped in swiftly to purchase it through the Reform Trust for the sum of £10,500. In his 1956 memorandum, Morrill wrote that the estate would provide ample room for a park, which he felt would need at least 15 or more acres with room for further expansion. Essington Hall offered all of this and more. The main house would provide accommodation for a library, exhibition and lecture rooms, 
offices, workshops, stores, a flat for a caretaker and even a restaurant. Whilst the existing 18th century gazebo and orangery in the grounds could also be incorporated into the park, along with its fine collection of 16th century yew trees and kitchen and flower gardens. He imagined the gardens planted with appropriate English flowers, shrubs and herbs, while the small stream running to the lake would make an ideal setting for the old water mill. Beyond the hall, he imagined a village of small cottages, shops and workshops, showing different periods and styles of architecture, each appropriately furnished. There would be a smithy, wheelwright and joiner, a weaver, rope maker, potter and other crafts that once flourished in small communities. Alongside these would be an inn and brew house, a church and school and one or two shops. All of these would be grouped along with houses and cottages around a village green on which would be staged open air plays, archery displays, morris dancing and other games, sports and pastimes. The shops would sell their own commodities and old craftsmen could ply their trade in the various workshops. At a distance from the central village, the estate offered space for farm buildings, windmills and what he called other typical features of the countryside. To better capture his vision for the park, he had a small booklet printed through the York Civic Trust the following year, setting out the argument and showing two detailed illustrations of the proposed layout. The first, shown here, shows the ground plan with the hall and its gardens intact, and then behind it the village, lake, post mill and water mill which incorporates the existing lake and stream. There's a coach and car park at the top of the plan, and the pamphlet imagines how the visitor would arrive, writing, leaving his car in the park at the Heslington Road entrance, the visitor would approach the village by a path along the avenue of trees beside the plantation. Passing through the village, he would find at the further end of the green, buyers and cart sheds set against the outer wall of the kitchen garden and used to house old farm implements. You will notice that the plan also has an urban street. The pamphlet explains that the Castle Museum already has a number of old buildings awaiting a place to be rebuilt, and that these include the great oak timbers from the Parliament House, which stood where Piccadilly now runs, as well as a smaller timber, timber house from the city. Rather than waste such buildings, Morrill sees them forming the nucleus of a small group of townhouses, which could be set up in the walled kitchen garden, and perhaps in time, if other buildings were offered, these could form an urban street or square, demonstrating the contrast between town and country. And you can see the urban square more clearly in this second illustration, which adds detail and visitors to the scene, as well as examples of some of the other buildings Morrill already had in mind for the park. The Parliament House from York, the Raindale Water Mill and the last Yorkshire Post Mill, as well as the Maypole on the Green. The urban square disappears from later iterations of the folk park, possibly because potential sites available were smaller and offered a bit less scope for the imagination than the large Heslington estate. The pamphlet is keen to emphasise that this is only a blueprint in any case. Signing off with an exhortation to put up the old buildings that are in hand and with some ducks on the mill pond, doves and dovecots and a cat on the doorstep, they will start to come to life again. All the rest can be added later. But while Morrill's memorandum and the pamphlet that followed made an attractive case for a folk park in York, a great deal more work was needed behind the scenes to make it a reality. Morrill's plans for the folk park are first mentioned in the Reform Trust minutes in June 1956, where he is recorded as saying he has had preliminary discussions with York Corporation with a view of handing over the agricultural land in Woodland of Heslington Hall for the creation of a folk park. However, he goes on to say that he has since reconsidered this, since such a folk park was unlikely to be carried out in a reasonable time by a local authority, and that therefore he was giving consideration to other means. A subcommittee had already been set up the previous December to consider the uses to which the hall and land could be applied. And this committee, which included Morrill and Peter Roundtree, was now tasked with looking into the folk park idea. The subcommittee reported back in September to say that Dr Singleton of the York Institute of Architectural Study had offered to prepare a plan for how such a park might work on the estate. The committee had also discussed the financing of the scheme it was feared that a folk park might, might end up being funded wholly by the trust, which would prove a very heavy drain on their resources. But Morrill assured them that the development of the park could be carried out by a separate trust headed by interested and notable people, with a national appeal made for funds to launch it. In December, he clarified that he envisaged making a gift of the land to a new charitable trust 
which, with the help of public donations, would create the park and then hand it over to the City of York, who already, of course, owned the Castle Museum and the famous collection of Dr Kirk. This plan was reiterated the following year, although now the land was to be given to the York Civic Trust, of which Morrill was chairman, who would sponsor a public appeal for funds. Progress on the Folk Park plan was nonetheless slow. In June 1957, subcommittee reported that the York Civic Trust and York Corporation's Castle Museum Committee were both in favour of the idea, and that the plan was still for the Civic Trust to launch the park and the City Corporation to maintain it. The corporation was still in the process of negotiating its takeover of York Museum Gardens, however, so Morrill felt the Folk Park plan should wait until this had been completed. In August, a piece appeared in the Times newspaper reporting that the Heslington estate had been offered for the site of a national English folk park and stating that the Castle Museum already owned a suitable water mill, which was dismantled near Whitby, and that Mr Morrill had purchased a post mill from a site near Doncaster. The Castle Museum had a maypole and an anonymous donor had offered a horse mill, and it added that those sponsoring the project believed that more offers of buildings and objects would flood in once the public appeal was made. In the meantime, however, the Reform Trust was footing the bill for the maintenance of Heslington Hall and estate, and they were keen to find some use for it to help with the cost of its upkeep, even if it was only a temporary one. Various schemes were discussed, including the Youth Hostels Association taking over the hall, or it being used as accommodation for students attending the summer courses in the city. In 1958, Leeds University approached the Trust about buying the hall. Morrill and his fellow directors agreed to offer it to them for £10,000, but with the condition that the sale would not include the stable block and the land necessary to build the folk park. As it turned out, Leeds University did not have the money to both purchase and adapt the hall for its needs. But another university was on the horizon, and this one would put pay to the Heslington Park idea for good. The campaign for a University of York began in the late 1940s and counted Morrill amongst its most active and enthusiastic members. By the 1950s, there was a York Academic Development Committee with a serious programme of work, initially to create summer schools and then to create formal institutes of learning as proof that York could be a centre for further education. The Borthwick Institute, incidentally, was one of these, founded in 1953. In 1959, the Reform Trust Minutes record the first reference to Heslington Hall and its surrounding land being used as a possible site for a university. It was in many ways an obvious choice. There was no space within the city walls for a uni new university, and the Heslington Estate was a large, undeveloped parcel of land within two miles of the city centre and already owned by a Roundtree Trust with close links to the Academic Development Committee, York Corporation and the Civic Trust, all of whom were key players in the university campaign. It was Morrill himself that proposed the mo motion in a meeting of the Trust in October 1959 they should undertake to transfer Hessington Hall and grounds to the new university once its creation was certain. And moreover, that they should make a contribution of £150,000 over the first 10 years for its development. At the end of the discussion, Morrill was presented with a book inscribed by his fellow directors in recognition of his long and sustained efforts to secure for York the highest academic status, that of a university of its own. In April 1960, the government approved the plan and in 1962, the Reform Trust formally transferred the Heslington Estate to the new University of York. Where then did that leave Morrill's Folk Park? When it became apparent that the new university would need the Heslington site, Morrill quickly began looking around for another and soon lit upon an area of land at Fulford to the south of the city. In 1961, Morrill proposed that Joseph Rowntree Memorial Trust carry out a survey of the river approaches to York, with a view to funding or campaigning for any necessary improvement works to be carried out. The Memorial Trust duly agreed and appointed a landscape architect, Mr Clark, to do the work, and Morrill immediately met with Clark and not only secured his support for folk parks beside the river, but also got him to suggest a good site for it, on a piece of land owned by York Corporation that had conveniently already been raised above flood level and was linked almost directly to the Castle Museum by the popular Riverside Walk known as the New Walk. Whilst not as large as the Heslington Estate, Morrill felt that the Fulford site offered some room for expansion and would act as a convenient outdoor extension of the Castle Museum. So keen was Morrill on this new site 
that you have Mr. Patterson, the curator of Castle Museum, create a colour plan for it and he turned this plan into his Christmas card for 1962. This is the plan that you saw at the beginning of this talk, giving you an idea of how the folk park might look and what it might include. Gone was the town street or square. Instead, Morrill described this park as showing the evolution of the English way of life in village and country during the past 500 years. In a new memorandum setting out his revised plan, he wrote that the village green would be available for open air plays, folk singing and dancing and traditional country games. It would be the site of the village cross, the pound, a well and the maypole, as well as the replica of the Troy Town maze near Terrington. As at Heslington, the park would include the post mill, water mill and horse mill that had already been donated or purchased. And there would also be a village inn, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, both boat builder and Romany encampment, workshops showcasing traditional crafts and industries in action. But the new site also allows for some exciting changes. The riverside location would allow live visitors to be brought by boat direct to the park's own landing stage, and the wharf could be used to display larger historic vessels like the Humber Barge and Canal Boats, as well as smaller fishing boats like the Coracle, which were not exhibited elsewhere. Fulford also had a disused parish church that Morrill thought could easily be incorporated into the folk village, showcasing its ritual and rural life and religious life. In summing up the revised plan, he wrote that he felt the new site would in time prove to be as attractive to visitors and residents of York as the Castle Museum had already proven to be. Once again, Morrill looked to the Reform Trust for help in making this new park a reality. Whilst he believed that the park would eventually pay for itself, a large injection of funds would be needed to launch, to develop and launch it. In December 1962, he proposed that the Trust make a grant of £10,000 to start work on the park, with a further grant the following year. And that in the meantime, he would also approach the Joseph Rowntree Memorial Trust and his own family trust for additional funds. A further document in the archive sets out the task at hand, which would involve first levelling and laying out the site, and then removing and re-erecting the various buildings, all of them almost likely over the course of several years. At their next meeting in March 1963, it was reported that the proposal to use the land at Fulford had been put before York Corporation, now known as York City Council. In the meantime, the York Rantry, Joseph Rantry Memorial Trust had offered £2,500 towards the scheme, and the Rantry Company had given another £1,000. In the same meeting, the Reform Trust made a grant of £12,000 to Morrill to be used for any charitable purpose he wished to mark his 90th birthday and his many years of service to York and to the Trust. Unsurprisingly, he chose to put the money towards his folk park. Morrill celebrated his 90th birthday in April 1963, but died less than two weeks later. He is remembered by the Reform Trust for his inspired and devoted leadership as chairman and his abiding love for York. It was his constructive imagination and unquenchable persistence, his fellow directors wrote, that was probably decisive in establishing York as a university city. Although he had not succeeded in achieving his dream of a folk park in his lifetime, Morrill had left the plan for one on a more of a secure footing, having found a site, secured initial funding and made an approach to the city council. And his family were keen to see his campaign succeed. Following his death, his son William, William took up the baton, taking his father's place on the York Castle Museum's committee and continuing to campaign for the park for the next 17 years. The first step William took was to secure the £12,000 promised by the Reform Trust, of which he was also a director. The Trust were happy to confirm that this money should, be all, should still be earmarked for the park, as Morrill wished, and William set about creating a charitable trust fund to oversee the campaign's finances. In doing so, he settled on the name of the Yorkshire Folk Park, rather than York Folk Park, in the hope that it would better attract support from across the county. The Trust was active by 1966, but work on the park could not proceed without the support and approval of the City Council, who owned the Fulford site, and this had not yet been formally given. In fact, nothing much seems to have happened at all with the campaign for four years, until the occasion of the city's 1900th birthday in 1971 brought it back into the public eye. In the summer of 1970, the scheme was mentioned in the local press in relation to a meeting of York City Council. In both cases, the coverage was very positive, unsurprising perhaps given the Yorkshire Evening Press's links to the Morrill family. The articles expressed disappointment that the scheme has languished for such a long time and it was still no closer to success. Making a start on the park would be a fine way to mark the city's anniversary, it argued, 
And in the meantime, its supporters were anxious to make sure the council didn't use the proposed site for something else. Councillor Thompson, evidently one of the supporters, is quoted as saying that York has one of the best, finest museums in Europe and should therefore have a folk park too. The initial articles were followed by a much longer one in the John Blunt column of the same paper, calling on the council to make a decision over the site for the park and to pledge its support for the scheme. Blunt writes that it's been 12 years and thousands of pounds since York Civic Trust first threw the idea into the melting pot. And although the council had pledged their support in principle, they had not given it formal approval and their delay was robbing it of the very thing it needed most, the rural heritage. Country crafts were fast disappearing along with the kind of buildings Morrow had hoped to save. Robert Patterson, curator of the Castle Museum, is quoted extensively throughout, expressing his disappointment at the delay and his fears that soon they would lose the opportunity entirely. Ten years ago, he is quoted as saying, he saw Yorkshire corn stacks topped with decorative corn dollies in a field on a North Yorkshire farm. Over the last six years, he had not seen any. He believed the last corn stack ever to be made had been made, except for in a museum. By this point, the folk park scheme had undergone some revision. The Raindale Mill was no longer available, having been rebuilt in the small patch of land behind the Castle Museum. And it was unclear whether the Fulford site was available either, as it was then being used for a council-sponsored travellers camp. A third possible site was now being suggested, this time a piece of land off Bishopthorpe Road, but it was all still dependent on the support of the council. The sticking point, of course, was money. Although John Bowes Morrill had managed to secure some initial funding, around £15,000 or so, it was thought that the costs of building and launching the park could be as much as £50,000, and that was back in 1963. By 1970, it was feared it could be double that. However, the Folk Park Trust were not ready to admit defeat. If the council were dragging their heels at the size of the investment they'd, been, they'd have to make, then the trust would try and raise more money. In September 1970, the Reform Trust agreed to increase the £12,000 gift they had made to Morrill in 1963 to £20,000, albeit on the condition that it was a loan that would have to be repaid if the scheme did not go ahead. With the £1,000 from the Roundtree Company, £250 from Westminster Press, and £25,000 raised from personal gifts and money from the Family Trust, by 1972, the Folk Park Trust had raised £50,000, which it offered to the council for the creation of the Folk Park. And it worked. In, September, in February 1972, the plan for a 30 acre folk park was finally approved in principle by the Council's York Castle Museum Committee to be sent on to be considered by the Finance and Planning Committee. William Bowes Morrill made sure it made the front page of the press, claiming that the park might be ready to open to the public as soon as eight to ten buildings had been erected, which would take perhaps six years in all, including a full year to prepare the site. Once again, Robert Patterson was quoted giving his enthusiastic support and the article included a plan of the proposed park, which was the most detailed one yet, placing it once again at the Fulford site and expanding it significantly. And here it is, the last known illustration of the Yorkshire Folk Park, created by Patterson and clearly drawing on Morrill's 1962 plan. It shows the full extent of the park, stretching from the end of the new walk right across to St Oswald's Road and including St Oswald's Church. All the features of the 1962 plan are there, the village, the caravans, the windmill and farm, but there are additions too. There's a small manor house now, a pinfold well and pigeon cot, as well as practical additions like toilets, refreshment huts, picnic areas, offices and a caretaker's house, and a large shed for museum storage. Sadly, this proved to be the closest the scheme ever came to reality. Based on the documents in the file, the plan stalled and then ultimately was abandoned for a number of reasons. The cost continued to be the main one. The scheme was approved in 1972, and in 1973, the British economy went into a recession which lasted for two years. As costs rose, the value of the £50,000 gift went down, and there was a feeling among city councillors expressed in newspaper articles and correspondence that a folk park risked becoming a financial burden on the city in very difficult economic times. This was compounded by the problems they faced in actually securing a site for it. When the plan was provisionally approved by the council, it was based on the Fulford Ings site, but it turned out that some of the site was privately owned, and by 1975, it was clear that these would be costly and difficult to obtain. There was also the more prosaic matter of car parking, 
The council's initial plans to create a car park on the opposite side of the River Ouse apparently faced such strong local opposition that the suggestion had to be dropped, making the site a difficult sell as a major tourist attraction. In November 1975, the chief executive of York City Council wrote to William Bowes Morrill to say that the council had reluctantly had to abandon the folk park project. The idea limped on for a few more years, with various ideas put forward to try and keep the essence of the folk park scheme alive. There were some discussions with the York, North Yorkshire Moors National Park about perhaps building the folk park there, or making it part of the existing Rydale Folk Museum, but these were rejected on planning grounds as it was felt they would create far too much traffic. Similarly, a plan to invest the funds in the Museum of Farming History at Merton outside York was not felt to be viable. Morrill even suggested some kind of urban folk park instead in the Casgway area, but this was also rejected by the council. By 1979, despite William's best efforts, the scheme was officially dead, and the main grant of £20,000 received from the Reform Trust was returned. The entire scheme from Morrill's initial memorandum to the final failure of the project lasted just over 20 years and leaves us with many what ifs. What if Morrill hadn't died when he did? What if the project had been started earlier or had been approved sooner? And what if the university hadn't needed the Heslington site? Ultimately, it seems to have been a case at the wrong place and the wrong time. But the fact that the scheme was put forward at all speaks to a very real concern about what was being lost as well as gained in the rapid progress of the 20th century. And the importance of the ordinary and the everyday in our understanding, not just of the past, but also, also of the present and how we came to be where we are. Today, the York Folk Park is something that only really exists in the archive, but there was one tangible result of the scheme. In 1980, the Reform Trust agreed to make a grant of £10,000 out of the money originally earmarked for the Folk Park for the purposes of creating a Victorian solicitor's office at Beamish Open Air Museum in County Durham. The office used the name of J and R.S. Watson, R.S. Watson being Robert Spence Watson, the Quaker reformer and solicitor whose daughter Bertha married John Bowes Morrill in 1902. The grant was duly paid and the solicitor's office can still be seen there today as part of the Ravensworth Terrace buildings and the replica Edwardian town. On the surface, this might seem a far cry from the Living Museum of English Rural Life Morrill suggested in 1956. But the origins of Beamish, too, lie in the Scandinavian folk park movement. It describes itself as a living, working museum that aims to illustrate the lives of ordinary people in northeast England, showcasing rural as well as urban life. And as such, I like to think that Morrill would have approved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sally. I think one of the, one of the uh, sometimes drawbacks of these kind of sessions is you can't hear the applause. Uh, from a virtual audience, but that would have been absolutely ringing. Thank you so much for that. Everybody who's here, uh, everyone who's watching online, if you could just put your questions into the Q&A below, uh, I'll pick those up as best as I can as we go through. Uh, we've got a couple in there already, but feel free to throw in as many as you like, uh, because Sally is here until around about uh, another 10 minutes or so uh, to pick up on any of those questions that I'm sure her presentation has, has, uh, has brought about. However, I'm going to do that thing and do chairs privilege, uh, Sally, and, and I'll take the first question, if I may. Um, could I just ask you, based on everything that you've said there, this was going to be a huge project, and it would be, be another of the great attractions of this city. What do you think York lost, or what do you think maybe York gained by not having this English folk park in its environment? I mean, I suppose one of the obvious things it gained is we did get the university instead. Um, and perhaps if if the time had been slightly different, if Morrill had got the park started on the Hesington estate before the university plans came to fruition, it could have been very different. And the University of York would, I think, probably have struggled to find a site as, as handy as the Hesington um, site. Uh, I think in terms of what it, of what York lost, I mean, reading the file and working on the papers, you do find yourself wishing there was a folk park in York. I think it would have been wonderful. Anyone who's visited St. Vagans in Wales or Beamish or um, the Wild and Downland Museum or any of the ones I mentioned, you know, will know how enjoyable folk parks are. And having having Castle, the Castle Museum in Kirkgate, which is this wonderful recreation of, of urban life, you can see where Morrill was coming from, where you think how wonderful if you could have come from that museum which showcased the kind of 
ur- you know, urban, not just uh, not just specifically York, but kind of urban life in the turn of the century. And then you could have gone to a sister attraction just a couple of miles away and also got to see kind of buildings that have been preserved. I mean, the buildings he was kind of preserving at the time were mainly from Yorkshire, although he was envisaging a national English folk park. The ones he started with were ones that he knew about in his area. So they were kind of Yorkshire buildings. So if you could have gone and seen some of those wonderful buildings in situ and gone to the village green and, you know, that that um, preservation of rural and traditional crafts, he very much felt that, you know, once the people who practiced those, you know, became old and died, those that, that knowledge would be lost. Um, which is often proven to be the case. And so that would have been a way of keeping those things alive. Moral wasn't kind of anti-modernisation, anti-progress, but he very much thought that just because you have progress didn't mean you just had to sweep everything else away and, and lose it forever. So I think that would have been, and you know, if we had the university and the folk park at the Fulford site, what a fantastic learning resource for the university too. So <laughs> all round, it would have been, yeah, I'd have enjoyed going to the York Folk Park, I think. Wouldn't it? Just wouldn't it have been great? Okay, uh, I'll just take some questions from the audience. Audience, thank you for the questions so far. Keep putting them into the Q&A. Uh, we'll get through as many as we can. So uh, we've got a question here about, um, if you just think, what, what are the main differences between a museum, folk or otherwise, and a folk park? What, what is the difference? Um, I think from kind of my reading for the talk, the a museum is very much more... I mean, in some ways, it's kind of a folk park is outside. It's actually bringing the buildings there. So while a museum might do a recreation, for example, I mentioned, uh, I think Northampton Central Museum had a recreation of a cobbler shop. It was a kind of recreation of one. It wasn't an actual cobbler shop. They had taken down, transported and built inside the museum in the same way that although Kirkgate has furnished its buildings authentically, the buildings themselves are not authentic. The buildings are create a 1930s creations of Edwardian and Victorian shops and buildings it has to be because it's being built inside they couldn't really go and get whole shops transport them in or perhaps they could but I think it would have been a challenge to build them inside the museum so a folk park is I suppose it would think of itself as perhaps more authentic it's actually bringing the physical buildings and taking them down carefully it's transporting it's putting them back up so they can kind of be seen in their natural settings of course it's it's inherently artificial you're creating a fake village or a fake town but the buildings that you're putting there are not in themselves fake you're trying to as the pictures of the um the buildings in Scanson in Stockholm showed they tried to recreate them to the, the sort of small farm buildings or put in a kind of woodland setting or in a field setting they have a small town there that's you know set in a kind of um flat sort of valley you know it's not in the middle of the woods they try to put them in authentic settings and I think the idea is that as far as it's at all possible you can kind of experience them as they were meant to be, as they were used. And Kirkgate does that to a certain extent. It tries to create a, a little microcosm of a town so you can walk around it and feel this is what it would have been like to walk around a Victorian town. And as Yorith Pete says about St. Fagan's, it shouldn't be that you have, you know, things under glass, dead things under glass. It should be something you can walk through the doors, go up the stairs, open the cupboards, get an f- idea of the physical feel and presence of the building and what it would have been like. Yeah, in feel so that 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 the, the differences in there is, is certainly not just like the fact it's outside; it's in its approach. Uh, yeah, it's, I well. think it's it's trying to actually recreate the 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 the, the, the experience in its entirety. So instead of just you looking at the artifacts that would have been in the house, you see them inside the house, and the house is also authentic, mm. and it's also sitting in a valley. If it's a a mill next to a stream with the water mill turning, so you get that kind of three hundred and sixty experience, I suppose, of what it would have been like. Definitely. A uh, question from the audience here uh, asking if you think plans for the folk park will ever be resurrected. Oh, I wish in my dreams. I mean, it would be lovely if it would be. I don't know if it ever could. I think one of the things that Moral worried about, which has kind of come to pass, is a lot of the buildings are now gone. I mean, when he was looking for them, it was the 50s. There was still that rapid change was still ongoing. A lot of the buildings were still there. And of course, now they're not in reality. And the ones that have been preserved are probably already at other open air museums um I don't know if the castle museum has anything in storage still um obviously the Raindale mill actually has been put up again uh, at the castle museum I don't know what happened to things like the 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 timber house from Helperby whether that also got put up somewhere else um so yeah I think it would be more difficult to do now without actually making uh reproductions of buildings rather than 
using, I don't know if we've got that many medieval buildings still knocking around the countryside, ready to be taken down, transported. <laughs> but it would be nice. Well, I would certainly like to visit it if it happened. <laughs> well, if anyone does have a, a set of medieval buildings and a bit of land to put them on. Um, yes, at, let us know. On a postcard, <laughs> yeah. Would, would just, uh, thank you to all the audience questions. I'm just going to wrap up with, with one question of my own, if I may. This is one that's just the, the, tickled all the way through. You've, you, in the way that you've pronounced it, uh, moral, as in JB moral, where I, you hear many a, peop, a person pronouncing it morale. Which, is there a right answer to that question? There is a right answer to that question. Ah. Um, yes, when I started doing the talk at the university, we do send, tend to say the morale library. And I was aware when preparing this talk that I wasn't entirely sure if it was moral or morale. So I consulted um, the moral expert, uh, Kath Webb, who uh, used to work at the Borthwick, but she wrote a book on John Bay's moral. Um, and she sent me definitive proof, which is a letter by Oliver Sheldon, who was a contemporary and friend of John Bay's moral, who wrote a letter to the lady in waiting to the Princess Royal, Princess Mary, uh, Countess of Harwood, who was coming to York and was going to do a speech um, telling her some facts about uh, moral, but also telling her how to pronounce it and actually writing down it's moral as in M-O-R-A-L and not morel with a score on the with the underline on the L. So there it is. I was like, that's there in black and white from the time that John Bose Marl was alive, written by his friend. And you cannot get more conclusive than that. No, uh, so I'm going to try and say the moral library now from now on. Moral. <laughs> it's the, the, the moral crusade starts here. Yes. I, I probably should say um, that if you are interested in, uh, to hear more about John Bose Moral, uh, there is uh, a book pub, uh, by uh, Catherine Webb uh, about JB Moral available from the Boston Institute for Archives. It is everything you would need to know, and may I say more. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, that brings us to the end of our session here. Thank you so much for a really, really interesting talk, uh, uh, enlightening us to something we never absolutely knew. Uh, but you never know in future, maybe we will have um, uh, our folk path in the end. Thank you to all of you in the audience as well for your questions and for coming along today. Uh, the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website. And you'll be contacted by email when the video is available to, vi to view. In that case, thank you very much, Sally. Thank you very much to everybody who's come along. Have a wonderful day and an excellent rest of the York Festival of Ideas and hope to see you again soon.